Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody once again, and for those of you joining us on television, this is just the third program in a row. I trust most of you know that now. We make four programs on a Wednesday afternoon, and uh, if you're ever coming through Tulsa in the uh, first part of the month, you call us and we'll make arrangements and show you how to get out here to the studio and uh, be a part of our studio audience. We always have a good time all afternoon. So anyway, uh, again, we always like to thank you for your prayers and uh, your letters, your help. And uh, we just feel that the Lord is using this humble layman. After all, I, I never cease to be amazed that uh, God can just use a plain, ordinary farmer. That's all I am. I have no degree in theology or anything like that. I guess that's probably obvious, but whatever. Uh, God is using it, and uh, we are realizing that we're using, being used to touch a lot of hearts and lives. Okay, I think uh, that's all we have to say for introduction. We are just an informal Bible study, and uh, we got no axe to grind. I don't try to trumpet my own group or attack anybody else. We're just going to see what the book says. All right, now we're in Hebrews chapter 2, and we're ready to move on into verse 6. My, we're making some headway today, aren't we? <coughs> okay, verse 6. Now remember in our last program, we spent the whole half hour dealing with the world to come up there in verse 5, which is the kingdom on an inhabited earth. And then we're going to see that the angels would never fulfill the requirements to be that ruler and king over that coming kingdom because they certainly don't have the power that the Christ, the Son, has. All right, so verse 6, where we see now, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now that's a quote from the Psalms. Or the Son of man that thou visitest him. Now this, of course, another reference to God the Son. Now verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Now that's kind of a play on words. It's better translated. He was made lower than the angels for a little while. Only for a little while was he made lower than the angels. And of course we'll have to go back to Philippians 2 in a moment to see what the purpose of all that was. But he was made lower than the angels for just a little while. Thou, speaking of God, the triune God, thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. In other words, this glorious earthly kingdom that we were introduced to back in verse 5. All right, now then verse 8, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, are you seeing how that the writer of Hebrews is constantly putting Christ where he belongs? He's not just the lowly Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Son. He's the Creator. He's the God of glory. And he was only made lower than the angels for that short period of time whereby he could go the way of the cross and taste death for every man as we'll probably see in the next half hour down in verse 9. But all right, now then up into verse 8. Again, speaking to God the, the Father, the triune God, however you want to put it, thou hast put all things, everything, in subjection under his feet. Now, you remember several programs back, we used the verse over and over and showed how all through Scripture the various writers quoted Psalms 110 verse 1. What was it? Come sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In other words, they'd be under his feet. And that's, of course, when he will assume then the power and the glory of the kingdom. All right, you got the same thing repeated again. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. Nothing was going to escape his rule and reign. And so the nothing is left that is not 
under him. Now then, the last part of the verse. What does this tell us? Oh, it's still future. Now there are a lot of people trumpeting this idea that everything prophetic is done. It's in the past. Well, not according to this. Not according to this. But now, the last part of verse 8, but now we see... What are the next two words? Not yet. Not yet. What does that mean? It's coming. Hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. But now we see, not yet, all things put under Him. Now let's go back and again chase down some other scripture references. Let's go back first to Philippians. Philippians. Chapter 2. And we're still on this whole concept of when he sets up this glorious earthly kingdom. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. All got it? Philippians chapter 2. And let's just drop in. These are my verse, some of my favorite verses. Those of you in my classes here in Oklahoma know we use them quite often. Verse 5. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. In other words, Romans chapter 12 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be conformed to the mind of Christ. Well, this is a Pauline statement that we as believers are to literally think to a degree, of course, as Christ thinks. We're to have his thoughts, which are higher than the mundane thoughts of this world. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, that is, Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, he never stopped being God, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he had no compunction about asserting his deity. All right, verse 7. But, but, the flip side, even though he was the sovereign creator, God of the universe, yet, as Hebrews said, he lowered himself to a position lower than the angels for a little while, and so he made himself, verse 7, of no reputation. He did not use his deity to subject the people he ministered under him at that time because he did not come to subject them, he came to save them. And so he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant or a bond slave. Now I think the last time we used this, maybe a few programs back, I made the statement, or maybe it's in one of my Oklahoma classes, I just made the statement not too long ago, the first thought that comes to my mind when I think of a bond slave back in antiquity were those poor benighted souls that were put down in the lower holds of a ship to pull the oars. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of those ships that were literally driven with oars who were manned by slaves. And they would man those oars until they probably died a physical death. They were thrown overboard and another one was put in their place. Now that's what it meant to be a bond slave. It was a life of misery. It was a life of enjoying none of the good things of this world. And you see, that's where Jesus went. You know, someone made the statement some time ago that after all, we should all be rich because Jesus was. Well, that's not the Jesus in my Bible. My Bible says that he had not even a place to lay his head. He didn't even have a den like the foxes had. He wasn't rich in material things. Oh, I know the psalmist says our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But say, that's not the Jesus of Nazareth. He had nothing of this world's good. He became as low on the totem pole as a bond slave, see? And then reading on in verse 7, 
Not only did he take upon himself the form of a servant, but he was made in likeness as a man. He would had all the human frailties. Now stop and think a minute. After a long day of putting up with the press of the crowds and everything else, what did he become? Tired. He became physically tired. He became hungry. He became sorrowful. You say, when? Oh, you all know. At Lazarus. At Lazarus' funeral. What did he do? Shortest verse in your Bible. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? In his humanity, he was just as sorrowful as any of you and I would be. And so this was all the price that he paid then that he could go the way of the cross and suffer the death that you and I deserve to suffer. All right, let's read on here. These are tremendous verses. Verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, then he humbled himself as a man and became obedient unto death. And not just an ordinary death, but what kind? Crucifixion, the most horrible. Now, I told one of my classes the other night, maybe I'm opening the door for something, I hope not. But uh, I told my class the other night, you know, when it comes to facing death for my faith, if they were just going to take me out and shoot me, that, that doesn't scare me a bit. To just be instantly snuffed out, that doesn't scare me. Hey, I'm ready to go. Now, if they were to torture me over a period of five, six years, like a lot of people have been, that gives me second thoughts, you know. I, I can't look forward to that at all. But you see, the Lord did. He knew the suffering that was coming. He knew exactly what was going to happen minute by minute. He knew how those Roman soldiers were going to abuse him. He knew how they would beat him as he carried the cross down toward Golgotha. He knew the pain that would happen when they drove the nails. He knew what it was going to be like to hang on that cross. And he never shrank from it all because he was going to be willing to pay the price of redemption for all of mankind. And we'll be looking at that more in detail in our next program when we see in our coming verses in Hebrews 2 that he suffered death, foretasted death for every man. But all right, now then coming out of verse 8, as he was obedient even to the death of the cross, now look at verse 9. Oh, what a change. Wherefore? Because of all that he did to accomplish that work of the cross, wherefore God, see, the God of everything again, also highly exalted him and has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Now, I know we're living in a culture today, and I know that, that we have to be careful that we uh, do not put others down, and uh, I never like to, you know, give that impression that uh, we're smug or arrogant or anything like that. But I have used the word over and over on this program, and I even gave mention of a gentleman up in Minnesota who, who really complimented me, and he was a, um, a retired minister of one of our large denominations, and it was probably as sweet and as great a compliment as I could have ever received when he came up one time after one of our teaching ser uh, seminars, and he said, Les, I admire you because you stick so closely to an exclusivist salvation. Well, I'd never quite heard it that way before, but uh, he said, that's what I've always preached. And I probably looked kind of quizzically at him, and he said, well, he said, it is. It's an exclusivist salvation. And this is what the verse says. There is no other. There is no other way. There is no other name given among men by whereby we must be saved. A Joseph Smith won't cut it. Or any of these others who claim to be a later prophet or whatever. There is only one name whereby we must be saved. And see, this says it so plainly that at the name of Jesus, no one else, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. I'll never forget hearing an evangelist many, many years ago who put it this way, and I imagine others have said it the same way. 
Every human being has that choice of bowing the knee and recognizing Christ as Savior in this life, or he'll do it at the great white throne in preparation for his doom. And isn't that true? That's exactly what it is. We can bow the knee and recognize Christ as Savior now and go on with joy evermore, or we can reject it, pass off this life, but one day come before him at the great white throne and every lost person of the ages are going to bow the knee and they're going to recognize finally that he was who he said he was. But it's going to be too late because he won't be the savior at the great white throne. He's going to be the judge. All right, so now then, verse 11, and that every tongue, every tongue, whether in this life or the one to come, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, these are all references that give rise to his coming exaltation. All right, uh, let's come back a few pages, honey, to Ephesians. To Ephesians, all still showing how that he was made lower than the angels for a little while, but the day is coming when he is going to be exalted. He is going to be the king over this earthly kingdom. And now let's come down to Ephesians chapter 1. Oh my goodness. Let's come in to verse 7. You know, I look at these and I think, oh, they're all too good to, to pass by, but for sake of time, we, we have to be judicious. Here in Ephesians 1, let's jump in at verse 7. Remember now that Paul is constantly using the prepositional phrase in Ephesians that speaks of our position in Christ. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, not our desert, but by his grace, Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery or the secret of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now here it comes in verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that's just another expression for this coming kingdom. Just another way of putting it, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, <clears throat> he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. Then verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now these are all references then alluding to his coming power and majesty that will be put above everything and all of his enemies will be put under his feet. All right, now then I think we can also go back to... Uh, Oh, let me see. I'm just thinking real fast here. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Let's go back to 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. All with me? Let's come in at... Oh, verse 12, because you see, none of these things could have been consummated without his resurrection from the dead. Now, it's one thing that he was crucified, but none of these things could have come to pass had he not been raised from the dead. That was a preeminent thing. All right, and so that's why we're going to look at this resurrection chapter for just a minute. He could not put everything under his feet until he had defeated his arch enemy, Satan, and death, which we're going to look at in the next program. 
by the power of his resurrection. All right, let's come in at verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, your faith is also vain. In other words, when people reject the resurrection, they are destitute of faith. They have nothing to go on because everything rests on this spiritual fact that Christ arose from the dead. All right, verse 15. Yea, not only is your, uh, your faith vain, but yea, we are found false witnesses. Paul says then we would be a liar because he witnessed Christ in his resurrection. We saw that in several programs ago. First, the apostles saw him. Mary saw him. Then upward of 500 saw him at once. And then Paul said what? Last of all, he was seen of me also. All proof, you see, of his resurrection. And so he's writing here with first-hand knowledge that, yes, Christ was alive. All right, so now then his argument is, verse 16, if the dead rise not, then Christ isn't raised. Now, how many people, even in our enlightened America, think that when you die, that's it, like a dog. That's it, all there's to it. Or they've got the wishful thinking that somehow they'll, they'll get there. But you see, they're not going to get there if their faith isn't in this crucified, buried, and risen Christ. And if we can't believe the resurrection, we're as good as nothing. All right, so now read on. If Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. It counts for nothing. And you are yet in your sin. In other words, there's been no forgiveness until we appropriate the whole gospel by faith. Then verse 18, Then they also who are asleep in Christ are perished. In other words, if someone dies believing in Jesus, as we see and hear so much, and yet they had no abiding faith in his resurrection, where are they? Lost. Lost. Now, we can't look at an individual. I can't. We can't look on the heart. But I can certainly tell them from Scripture what they better be putting their faith in. And if they don't have their faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Christ, I don't care how much they talk about Jesus, they're doomed. And we have to be careful that we never mislead people that they're somehow going to make it short of Paul's gospel. All right, then verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that's a lot of professing Christians today. Oh, they talk about Jesus and they claim that and love Jesus, but they, on the other hand, have never placed their faith in that suffering, crucified, risen Lord. All right, now then I wanted to bring you all down to verse 24, so let's just keep going. Verse 20. Verse 20. But now, now, no ifs, ands, buts about it. Christ is risen from the dead. He has become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, and like I said, we're going to be looking at that in the next half hour. For as by man came death, by man the second man, the second Adam, Jesus of Nazareth, the second man came also the resurrection of the dead. So on the one hand, we have the federal head of the human race, Adam, who plunged us into the fall and into our lost estate. The second Adam has accomplished everything to bring salvation to everyone that will believe it. All right, then verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, there won't all be believers, of course, but Christ himself said, in fact, come back to John's Gospel, chapter 5, honey. 
Back to John's Gospel, chapter 5, I think we got time. And this is exactly, I think, what Paul is alluding to. That even the lost, now a lot of people don't realize this, I know they don't, but even the lost are going to be resurrected. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28. Jesus is speaking He's in his earthly ministry, and he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. In other words, everyone who has ever lived and died is going to be resurrected. Verse 29, they shall come forth. They who have done good, in other words, people of faith, will come to a resurrection of life. They who have done evil, in other words, they've stayed in unbelief, they're going to come to the resurrection of condemnation. There was the two resurrections, and of course, the book of Revelation separates them then by a thousand years. But anyway, come back to 1 Corinthians. You only got a couple minutes left, and we got to wind this one up. And so now in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 22 again, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order or company, Christ and those who came with him in the first fruits at his resurrection, afterward those that are Christ at his coming, which I feel will be the rapture of the church. And then verse 24, this is the verse I want to look at. Then cometh the end. In other words, as human history as we now know it. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the what? The kingdom. See, here it comes. This kingdom over which he's going to rule and reign. He will give up the kingdom, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until, there's a time word again, he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet, not just the empires of politics, but now verse 26, and we're going to have to wind it up. And so the last enemy that shall be destroyed or put under his feet is death, our greatest enemy. And then verse 27, for he hath put all things under his feet even death, which will be the finality of that greatest enemy that we know, and it'll Thank be you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly